Good morning, afternoon. Um, I want to thank the National Council for inviting me to give this talk. What an awesome meeting this has become, and I'm grateful that you're all here. My name is Lisa Dixon. I am a psychiatrist. I'm a mental health services researcher, but I also, most importantly, have a brother who has schizophrenia, and, and here we are. All, all, cute, all the cuteness um, of me and my two brothers, and there are actually three other kids in the family, but I like that picture so much, I put that one up. But now I wanna, I wanna bring you from um, the mid-60s to 1982. And that was when I was starting medical school. And it was at that time that my brother should have been finishing medical school, but he didn't finish. He was thrown out of school, he wasn't able to complete all his courses, and was sent home. No information, we, we had no idea, the family had no idea uh, what had happened. And he was spending most of his time in his, the room of his childhood drinking gallons and gallons of water. I now know that that's psychogenic, uh, that polydipsia um, is a sign of schizophrenia. And he wasn't making a whole lot of sense, and, and our family was, was really in disarray. Uh, my father had just died of a heart attack, and uh, the rest of us were kind of uh, sprinkled uh, all over the, the world. And um, so me being the, the medical student who had to kind of have the answer, um, I, called, um, I called the psychiatrist in my school who was in charge of medical student mental health. And I explained what was going on, and it was, uh, he was so kind and compassionate, as, as Dr. Lieberman talked about. And he said, um, Lisa, come, why don't you bring uh, your mother in, and we're going to have a conversation. And, and here's the office where I imagine we sat. Of course, it was a long time ago. And it was one of those dreary analysts' offices with you know, a couch, and it was kind of cold, but, but in fact, what went on in the office was light. And there's the light of the office. This doctor, Dr. John Talbot, sat with us and he explained what schizophrenia was. And he, he made us understand uh, what the symptoms were, what my brother uh, might have been experiencing. And he also shared with us what to expect. And it, and it wasn't pretty. It definitely wasn't pretty. But the odd thing was that being given the kind of information and help and support and, and validation made all the difference for us. It, it, it didn't help my brother at that time, but it made all the difference for us so that we could uh, move forward and we had some sense of being prepared for what was to come. And in hindsight, I, I think about that and I, and I realize something uh, that I didn't quite know then, which was that my first real contact with mental health and family-based supports was about as good as it could get. I mean, that interaction transformed you know, the, the world of my family from, from uh, despair, confusion, terror, to at least some sense of control, moving forward, we know what to do when. And, and um, you know, in, in retrospect, I, I think that was inspiring for me to, uh, and, and it made me want to ensure or, or work to make that kind of contact, to make that kind of interaction, something that every family would have access to. And, and of course, you know, what else did I not know then? I didn't know then how challenging that would be now some 30 years later to see how difficult it is and has been to have the family the patient, the consumer, and the, the, and, and the profession, us clinicians, working together. OK. So now we have to get to work, all right? Um, what do we know? What do we know about including families in care? We know an awful lot. We know that when we include families in care, whether it's schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, uh, other mood disorders, anxiety disorders, when we include families in care, the patient does better, reduced hospitalization, reduced relapses, improved functioning, improved hope, improved recovery. Over and over again, research has shown that. 
Um, and not only that, not only does the patient do better, but the family does better. We do better. So that's, that's the first thing we know. Um, the second thing we know is that it doesn't happen. Um, it doesn't happen uh, hardly at all. So with, with this slide, it's not a great image here, but it's meant to show you that across a lot of different research studies, both in research settings and in uh, routine clinical settings, the rule is that families are not connected to care, are not involved. They're not invited, or if invited, they don't um, uh, accept the invitation. And, and if you look at the research, again, this is research not just done in, in academia, but done in, in the kind of clinics that I've worked in and I think we all have worked in and some of you are in charge of. It doesn't happen. Maybe 10, 20, 30% at most of the time are families, and again, I'm talking about adults, um, uh, are, are, are families involved? Is there any contact? And so, so where does that leave us? Where does that leave us? And for me, this is where it leaves us. It leaves us isolated. It leaves all of us uh, really uh, uh, wanting. And, and I think about you know, what my family situation was before we had that conversation with Dr. Talbot. And I kind of want to share another story, uh, again, just from my life. Um, uh, this was in 1989. I was just finishing uh, my residency. And my brother had been hospitalized for, I don't know, several months, maybe more. And, and, and he was discharged, and there was no real dialogue or, or discussion around his discharge. And he had accumulated quite a bit of money, I think Social Security money, while he was in the hospital. And when he got out, he apparently uh, decided that he needed a vacation. And, uh, you know, understandable. And so, um, he went to the Bahamas. But this, this was not the Bahamas that my brother visited. Um, and the reason I know that is because we got a call from the American Embassy in the Bahamas that my brother was in jail. And he had been picked up. And so uh, myself and, and another of my brothers went down there. And you can imagine the expression on the face of the taxi driver when we told him we wanted to go to jail. Um, and I don't mean to make light of it, but the whole thing was so surreal uh, that I can almost only laugh at it at times. So we got to, we got to the jail, and uh, uh, my brother was, was delirious. He, he, I think he was actually near death. He hadn't had anything to eat or drink for probably a day or two. I think they thought that he was high on drugs and that he was going to come down. But he didn't come down. He was really, really psychotic. And so we were able to get him transferred to, to the hospital in the Bahamas, which again, if you need to go to a psychiatric hospital, it's not so bad, um, at least from the outside. Um, but uh, again, not to make light of it, but, but he, again, uh, he was treated and, and returned to the United States. But, but this, this really was um, potentially tragic. And I'm gonna come back to this when we talk about maybe how, how things could have been different. Okay, so now we're back to work. Um, uh, ooh, excuse me, sorry, I'm not real cool with these slides, so, all right, great. Okay, so, so let's go to think about this. We have to think about how we got here. How did we find ourselves in this situation? And I approach that question by, um, by thinking about this, the problem from multiple points of view. So let's, let's, let's think about the, pro the, the problem or the challenge from the clinician's point of view. And I'm a clinician, and I would say, well, you know, why do I not have much contact with, with, my, with the families of my patients? Well, one is I don't have time. I do not have time. I'm concerned about the, um, the, the privacy and the confidentiality of my patients and HIPAA. Also, you know, I don't quite know how to do it. I'm not really all that well trained around working with families. And also, I, I actually am not clear on the benefits. I, I haven't, I, I don't really know, I don't, I don't have uh, the knowledge about what, what family involvement uh, can do. And sometimes I'm even, not even sure how to bill for it. So these are some very legitimate issues that clinicians have in terms of seeing families. Now let's go to the family's perspective, all right? So families also you know, may not always jump at this option. So you know, why might that be? Because families, families um, may have, you know, there's competing needs. 
families have lots going on, and I think you know probably all of you are aware. If we're working with families that have uh, a, a lot of challenges and issues, you know, this one person with mental illness may not be the number one priority or the only priority. Families also experience stigma, and they don't necessarily want to be associated with the mental health center. And families also um, are unaware of the benefits. And finally, you know, families. Um, also may have had bad experiences which, which make them sort of reluctant to approach the mental health center. And then in my mom's case, this was earlier on in my brother's illness, he, um, she, she was worried about his driving because she was worried that he, he wasn't concentrating, he might get into an accident. And so she told the doctor that, or worried about it with the doctor, and the doctor was like, whoa, like, you know, you're really, um, trying to squash, you know, your son's autonomy and independence. And, you know, so, and, and, and I could see where he was coming from, but again, that, that really made her feel that she wasn't understood, and it really made her hesitant to, um, to open herself up in the future. And so, you know, these are, these are legitimate issues. And then finally, if we get to, if we get to the patient or the consumer, um, what, what, what does he or she say about family involvement? And, and we know from, from research, important research, that patients will say, well, you know what, I, I, I don't want to burden my family. They, they're worried. They don't want to be, you know, as an adult, well, I shouldn't have to be dependent on my family. And, and there's actually sometimes shame in that and humiliation in that. So, you know, patients may say, I don't, I don't think so. Also, um, what consumers will tell us is, is um, that they, they're not so sure that it's going to help. Oh, how is it going to help? I don't know how it can help. And finally, and this is kind of where I feel like there's a, there's a, there's a, a way to move forward with this. You know, I say, well, if someone were to ask me, Lisa, you know, do you want your family involved in your mental health care? And I would say, I would say it depends. I would say it depends because I would want to set the terms. I would want to say, well, maybe this one, but not that one. I want to talk about this topic, but not that topic. I would want there, I would want to have some control. And so if we think about this notion of it depends, I think that this, this allows us to have a path to sort of reduce that isolation. And, 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 and the way that that works is this. We call it shared decision making. And I, and I bet most of you have heard of shared decision making, but maybe haven't really thought a lot about what it is. And so shared decision making is, is a process. It's a collaborative process that allows the clinician and the patient to work together to make treatment decisions that are informed by the best available evidence and also by the patient's preferences and values. And so it's this you know, really person-centered approach that, 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 um, that encourages dialogue. And so how might this work with this issue of families' involvement in care? And so a number of us, and there may be some of my colleagues in the room here, um, we created this intervention that we called REORDER. And what does that stand for? It stands for recovery-oriented, and I think we all know what that means, right? Sort of, we're talking about helping that person meet their goals, um, fulfill you know, their dreams, um, in a way that respects agency um, and, 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 um, and respect. Decision making. So decision making, and here the decision is family or no family involvement for relative support. So here, and this was kind of, I was, when I was making this, I was like, you know, it can be relatives supported, so it can be for the support of the individual with mental illness, or it could be S apostrophe for the support of the caregivers. So reorder, recovery-oriented decision-making for relative support. And so what does that mean, and what does that have to do with shared decision-making? And what I'd like to sort of at least tease, you know, tickle you with this idea that Shared decision making, if we implement this, it can, it can really move this, this, it depends forward. So how does that work? So the first thing in shared decision making is there's choice talk. So the choice is, in this case, should, uh, uh, do, you, does the, do you want your family involved in your care? You have a choice. You have a choice, yay or nay. And then we have option talk. And what option talk is, is option talk is all the different possibilities. 
And in this case, for family involvement, it could be anything from we'll send an informational brochure home to your family to, you know, we have family psychoeducation that's, you know, two weeks, every two weeks of, of, um, of a family group for nine months. And anything in between, a phone call, a meeting, a consultation. So there are all those options, and all of those options are possible, or at least some of them are possible. And then finally, there's decision talk. And what decision talk is, is the process of weighing the pluses and the minuses, what's important and what's not important to that patient to arrive at a decision. And when we did this, when we did this in a study, what did we find? We found that uh, before reorder, only 10% of these individuals had any family contact with the provider. And afterwards, it was, five, it was increased by fivefold. It went from 10% to 50%. And in the comparison group, it didn't change at all. And this was a randomized trial, yada, 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 pointy head scientists, meaning that both, uh, you know, bo both groups were essentially the same. And the only thing that was different was reorder. And the thing I want you to know is that where we did this study, there were family education specialists and family support specialists and all kinds of fancy trained people to do family work. But without the front door, without that shared decision making invitation, it didn't, it didn't matter. You know, nobody came, nobody asked for it. So it's not really enough just to make it available. We need to, to, to use this kind of shared decision making frame of choice and options and decisions to bring it into our practices. And in, and in this study, not only was there increased family participation, but, there, but the patients who participated had lower levels of paranoia and greater ratings of recovery. So it really translated to better outcomes uh, for the patients. And so I want to um, conclude by sort of going back to the situation of my brother and the, and the trip to the Bahamas and say, well, what, how might things have been different had, had reorder or something like it been offered to my brother? And I, and I'm, and I'm making this up, but I, I really think it, it could have happened this way. So that therapists could have said to my brother, well, what, what are your goals? What are your goals? And I think my brother would have said, well, I, I want to go on a vacation, because we do that. But I also, you know, I, I like basketball. I want to play some ball. And, and then the therapist says, OK, so you have a choice here. You have a choice. Do you want to involve your family in, that, um, in, in trying to meet those goals? And, and also, if you do want to involve your family, there's a couple of different ways that we can do it. You know, it doesn't, it can be just a little bit, it can be a lot. And it might have, the person might have gone through some of the choices. And so I imagine my brother would have said, eh, I don't think so. You know, my mother, she's quite elderly. This is really hard for her. And plus, you know, sometimes she doesn't, uh, she makes things more complicated. Okay, the therapists say, well, all right, I get that. So that's the downside, that's the downside. Well, is there an upside? Is there an upside? Is there, um, is there an advantage to you for involving uh, your, your family? And John might have said, you know, maybe there is, because actually um, uh, my, my mom actually is pretty good at getting things done. She's pretty organized. And you know what? If, it's possible that you know, maybe, a whole, maybe the family could go on a vacation. We used to do that. And, and I need a vacation, so maybe, maybe, maybe we can all do it together like we used to. And, and I think, and the therapist said, okay, we'll just do one session. And, and if your mom can't make it, we'll talk on the phone. All right, we, won't, we don't have to do you know, every week for uh, three years or whatever. We can just do this one session. And I think my brother would have agreed. And I think my mother would have agreed. And I just, I kind of want to conclude by saying, then, you know, the, 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 um, the Bahamas may have happened, but, but the Bahamas that we want, not the Bahamas in jail, but the Bahamas at the beach. So I hope that I've, I've made you curious about this and, and, and made it clear how simple it is. It's, 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 it can be a part of everyone's practice. It can be in every office of all of our clinics, of all of our agencies. Thank you.